We begin with President Trump making a major announcement. It's supposed to happen in about 45 minutes here. It's supposed to happen at 10 a.m. Uh, and that is an, uh, it's an amazing thing. He's supposed to, the rumor is, not just announce that the United States' view now officially is that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel, but also that he's going to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This is a great and brave thing to do. And I'm gonna give you a multiplicity of reasons why this is a great and brave thing to do by President Trump. And not something, frankly, that I expected from President Trump. I, I Maybe the statement about Jerusalem being Israel's capital, because lots of presidents have said similar stuff, but not the statement about moving the embassy, because that's always been politically dicey. So the law is, and it has been since 1995, Congress passed a law, and they passed it overwhelmingly, that, that said that Israel's capital was Jerusalem and that it should remain undivided. That law was passed 93 to 5 in the Senate and 374 to 37 in the House in 1995. For years, the president has been waiving that law. Bush did it, Clinton did it, Obama did it. None of them would actually build the embassy because they supposedly didn't want to undercut the peace process. But really what it was about is they, they wanted to cater to and surrender to the whims of the Palestinian Authority, a terrorist group, as well as other Muslim nations that were propping up that terrorist group. This was stupid policy. So let's begin with the facts, okay? Jerusalem is, was, and will be the eternal capital of Israel. Jerusalem is only important. The only reason you've heard of it, the only reason anyone cares about it, is because the Jews made it important. Okay, that is literally the only reason. Otherwise, it's just another city in the Middle East. It was both the capital of the kingdom of Israel and the site of the temple. It was the wellspring of Judaic thought for literally millennia. Okay, when I pray three times a day, Jerusalem is mentioned frequently in those prayers. Both Christianity and Islam value Jerusalem because Judaism did first. The dream of Jerusalem has animated the Jewish people for its entire existence the most famous case being in Psalms 137, where it says, if I forget the Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. Jerusalem is mentioned literally hundreds of times in what we call Tanakh, that'd be the Old Testament, so that includes the Torah, as well as the prophets and the writings. The only reason that it's not mentioned specifically in the five books of Moses is because at that time it was actually two cities, one called Yeru and the other called Shalem, and then it was put together into Yerushalayim, right? It became one city, sort of like Buddha and Pesht became Budapest. In any case, it's always been the center uh, of Judaic thinking. It's always been the holiest spot in Judaism. Jerusalem, by contrast, is not mentioned one single time anywhere in the Quran. If Jews don't have a claim to Jerusalem, and this is the, the, the root of why Muslims want to declare that Jews don't have a claim, also it's the root of why the papacy has been really split on Jerusalem. Right? There, there have been popes who have been pro the idea of Jewish sovereignty in Jerusalem, and then the current pope says that it should be internationalized which is just insipid, uh, because if you have Muslim rule over Jerusalem, that means nobody else gets to come in. And again, Jewish sovereignty over a Jewish holy site seems like the basic, the basic notion is just moral, especially since Jews have maintained the holy sites of both Muslims and Christians in Jerusalem. If Jews don't have a claim to Jerusalem, they don't have a claim to anything. They have a claim to nothing. If they don't claim to Jerusalem, there's no claim to Tel Aviv, there's no claim to Haifa, there's no claim to Yaffa, Yaffa, there isn't, there's no claim to Akko, there's no claim to any other city in Israel if you don't have a claim to Jerusalem. Okay, that's fact number one. And Trump is recognizing an established fact on the ground. Number two, as I say, Congress has long recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, not just in 1995, this year. Because you're seeing a bunch of Senate Democrats now, oh, how dare Trump. How terrible for President Trump to say this. How could President Trump, to, he's going to lead to a conflagration. Well, that's not what you jerks were saying literally six months ago. In June, there was a resolution that was passed on the floor of the Senate. It was passed 90 to nothing, zero dissenting votes, 90 to nothing, saying that Israel's remaining, its, its, its eternal capital is Jerusalem and it should remain undivided. Okay, third point, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital recognizes Israeli sovereignty. Okay, Israel gets to negotiate on its own behalf. It's not up to the United States or any other foreign nation to negotiate on Israel's behalf with regard to its own capital. To understand how important this is, imagine that foreign bodies came in and told the United States that we had to give up Washington, D.C. Now imagine that Washington, D.C. wasn't just a city that was built on a swamp so that we didn't have to build it inside a state. It had been divinely ordained by God for the American people. Okay, that's how important Jerusalem is to the Jews. It is the basis of all Judaic thought and all Judaic history. And people who are saying they're going to force Israel into making these concessions, it's immoral. Okay, Israel gets to make a call on its own. Okay, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital will minimize violence. You're hearing a lot of myths today from the left. Oh, look at it. Violence. Terrorism is coming. First of all, the Palestinian Authority is, was, and always will be a terrorist entity. Hamas is, was, will be a terrorist entity. Islamic Jihad is, was, will be a terrorist entity. All of the people threatening violence today were anti-Semites yesterday. They will be anti-Semites tomorrow. They were terrorists yesterday, and they will be terrorists tomorrow. If it's a day ending in why, the Palestinian Authority is interested in murdering Jews in terror attacks. The same is true, of course, of Hamas. 
The idea that the Jerusalem is the sticking point in negotiations is just not true. One thing that will happen by recognizing Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem is that the Palestinians may lose hope that they can pry Jerusalem from Israel by pressuring the United States or pressuring the West through terror attack. Maybe they'll finally recognize reality and they'll recognize this is just not going to be part of the negotiations. Okay, fifth, the United States should not be bullied by terrorists, period, anywhere, all over the world. The idea that the United States ever signed off on the Oslo Accords is ridiculous. Israel never should have either. The idea that you're going to be blackmailed by people, that you're, they were going to say to you, you know, if you just give us land, then we'll stop murdering your children. Blackmail used to be a violation of both domestic and international law. Then it was made into the centerpiece of American foreign policy in the Middle East for 20 years and the centerpiece of Israel-Palestinian policy for 25 years. It never worked. Oslo is a full-scale disaster because it turns out the person who's trying to blackmail you wants the money. Okay, they don't want to turn back over the, 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 the degrading material. If somebody steals the porn off your computer and then they want to blackmail you because they have the porn on your computer, their goal is not to give you back the porn on your computer. Their goal is to continue getting money out of you. Okay, Oslo was always a blackmail deal. Ending that blackmail deal is good for the United States. It's not caving to terrorism. Also, as I say, recognizing reality makes peace more possible. So a big underdeveloped piece of news that came out last week is that the Saudi monarchy reportedly summoned Palestinian leadership and told them to support a peace deal with the Israelis. Not only that, that deal would retain major Israeli settlement blocks, prevent the establishment of a standing Palestinian army, and leave the PA without Jerusalem as a Palestinian capital. In other words, the Saudis knew about this already. Everybody who's claiming, oh, the Saudis are so mad. The Saudis are not mad. The Saudis knew about this. They were paving the way about this. Jared Kushner over at the White House, I'm sure, was talking to Saudi Arabia. You know, two weeks ago, people were saying he's kowtowing to the Saudis. Now they're saying he's stabbing the Saudis in the back. Is it possible that maybe he was talking with the Saudis? Is it possible that the new anti-Iranian alliance, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Israel, that that alliance is strengthened by this status being clarified? That we can finally get this issue off the table? Then now that this is clear, that the, the United States recognizes the truth that Jerusalem is Israel's capital, that Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt are just going to have to accept it if they want this alliance against the Iranians. As I say, this also means continuing the anti-Iranian alliance and forwarding the anti-Iranian alliance. Right? In, in 1991, during the Gulf War, George H.W. Bush faced a choice. Israel was hit by Scud missiles by Saddam Hussein, and Israel wanted to join the coalition to topple Saddam Hussein, and the, or, or at least to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And H.W. said to the Israelis, don't get involved because you'll fracture our coalition. It was a bad move. H.W. should have said, sure, get involved. And then he should have said to the Saudis, you don't like it? Well, then fine, deal with it yourself. You don't like Israel being on your side? That's your problem. He could have forced a peace through mutual assurance. He could have forced a peace through mutual recognition of common interests. And that's exactly what's happening in the aftermath of Iran. Okay, so I wanted to lay out all of those reasons to show you that what Trump is doing here is not just moral, it is also smart. Also want to point out here that all of the talk about how this recognition is going to cause violence, violence in Jerusalem has long predated any of these negotiations. I'm going to give you a brief history of Jerusalem here so you have more information today than you did yesterday, okay? In 1929, before there was an Israel, before there was Jewish sovereignty over Jerusalem, before there was Arab sovereignty over Jerusalem, it was British mandate Palestine, right? It was the British running Jerusalem, and there were riots in Jerusalem by Arabs against Jews, 17 people were killed. Why? Because Jews had the temerity to bring chairs to the Wailing Wall, to the Western Wall, the second holiest site in Judaism. The holiest site in Judaism is the Temple Mount. Jews are still not allowed up on the Temple Mount because the Dome of the Rock is up there and the Muslims run it. So Jews will allow Muslims into Jewish areas, but Muslims will never allow Jews into Jewish areas, which is why Jews should run the place and not Muslims. Okay, but in 1929, before any of this was an issue, before any of it existed, right, at that time, the Jews just wanted to bring chairs for the elderly and infirm to the Western Wall. So Arabs rioted and killed 17 people. Then they rioted in, in Hebron, in, in Hebron, and they killed 60 more Jews. There's a, a report from the British. Here's what it described. Quote, Arabs in Hebron made a most ferocious attack on the Jewish ghetto and on isolated Jewish houses lying outside the crowded quarters of the town. More than 60 Jews, including many women and children, were murdered. More than 50 were wounded. Okay, fast forward to 1948. So Israel accepts the deal, the partition deal, from the UN. The UN was going to partition Jerusalem. It was going to divide Jerusalem. Instead, the Arabs blockaded Jerusalem, cut off all the roads, and tried to basically put the Jews in Jerusalem, the largest, most Jewish city in Israel, under siege. The Israelis, at the cost of thousands of lives, finally broke through. But East Jerusalem remained in Arab hands, in Muslim hands. And not only that, so did the Western Wall, so did the Temple Mount. So, was everything peaceful? Was everything fine when the Arabs were running it? 
The answer was no, of course, because in 1964, while the Arabs were still running East Jerusalem and Jordan had sovereignty over East Jerusalem, the Palestine Liberation Organization was formed. That would later become the Palestinian Authority. That was Yasser Arafat's group. In 1964, their stated goal, the full destruction of the state of Israel from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. That was their slogan. Okay, that was while they were running Jerusalem. So anyone who says that Jerusalem is the sticking point, Jerusalem is not the sticking point. In 1967, Israel finally takes over East Jerusalem and frees East Jerusalem. By the way, when I say freeze, I mean that the Arab parts of East Jerusalem are still run like an Arab dictatorship, even though Israel has sovereignty. When I visited Israel in, in 2001, it was the middle of the Second Intifada, when we came out in East Jerusalem, I had to be guarded by Israeli soldiers. If you are a Jew walking through East Jerusalem, Arab East Jerusalem, your life is in danger. If you are an Arab, a Muslim, walking through West Jerusalem, no problems at all. Because that's the way tyranny versus democracy works. By the way, Israel handed back control of the Temple Mount to the Islamic Waqf, which is a huge miscalculation. Jews are still not allowed to pray on the Temple Mount. If I went there and tried to pray, I'd be arrested. In 1993, Israel agreed to negotiate with the terrorist Palestinian Authority, including over Jerusalem. What happened? Massive uptick in terror. In 2000, at the Camp David Summit, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak of the Israeli Labor Party offered Palestinian terrorist Yasser Arafat control over East Jerusalem and the Temple Mount itself, according to Bill Clinton. Arafat didn't even submit a counteroffer. He left the table and he started the Second Intifada, resulting in the murder of over 700 Jews. I was in Israel when the Spiral Pizzeria was bombed, and I remember walking past the ruins of the pizzeria in the center of Jerusalem. All of that after Israel had offered East Jerusalem to the Palestinians. In 2008, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert offered a new Palestinian terrorist dictator, Mahmoud Abbas, international control of Jerusalem's old city, which would include the holy sites. Not only that, he also offered some of Israeli land to make up for the Israeli settlements that had been built and an Israeli land strip that would connect the Gaza Strip to Judea and Samaria. Abbas turned it down without a counteroffer and then launched another round of violence in coordination with Hamas in Gaza. So all of this talk about how it's just Jerusalem that if, 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 we, if we were to solidify the status of Jerusalem, this would cause violence? No, Jerusalem is an excuse for violence. And if Jerusalem were in Arab hands, there would still be violence because there was when it was in Arab hands. Okay, so now you have all the background that you need on this particular topic. So don't believe any of the mythology. Trump is making a moral move and a politically smart move and a politically valuable move for American policy in the Middle East.